Okay, so um, we're going to get started. Um, make sure we have enough time for tonight. As we said, we're very excited for tonight's presentation. Um, this wraps up our mind body connection series. So tonight we have Kelly Hayes Crook presenting. And before we begin, we just let you know that we're proudly supported by the sponsors we have listed on the screen. Oh, somebody else joined from Arizona as well. All right, and tonight uh, our agenda is first, I will provide an introduction of Migraine Canada. I'll then introduce Kelly. Um, Kelly will then follow with her presentation on retraining your brain, strategies to reduce chronic migraine symptoms. And at the end, we will do the question and answer. So Migraine Canada, who we are, we are a federally registered charity supporting the 4.5 million Canadians living with migraine and headache disorders. Our mission is to improve the lives of Canadians with migraine and headache disorders through our five pillars, advocacy, awareness, education, research, and support. Um, as I said tonight, our presentation, it concludes our very successful Mind-Body Connection webinar series. We're so excited. Um, how many people are interested? How many people joined the webinars live and have since watched the recordings? And just to let you know, our Q2 webinars are now posted on our events page. So please uh, check it out and you can register now for them. Um, as we do with every webinar, we provide the following disclaimer that this webinar provides information and not medical advice. Please note that the information presented and discussed might not apply to your own medical situation and always discuss medical treatments with your own healthcare provider who knows your personal medical history. And just some general webinar etiquette. Um, we really do appreciate your questions. They inform our advocacy priorities and they just add to the general webinar experience. Um, for this presentation, we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. Um, try not to put them in the chat because it can get lost within the chat. So I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout. And after Kelly's presentation, um, we'll ask, we'll present the questions to her to answer. And any questions that we don't have time to get to or she's not able to answer this evening, um, you can email us at info at migrainecanada.org and we will get the answer to you. For any healthcare professionals joining us tonight, you can also follow up after the presentation with a request for a participation certificate. And just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and we will email you a link within 48 hours. Okay. Oh, for some reason, Kelly, your picture didn't come up here. Sorry about that. Okay, um, right here. <laughs> just in the corner, everybody. So as I said, tonight our presenter is Kelly Hay Crooks. Kelly has experienced migraine for more than 30 years. A retired school teacher for the past six years, Kelly has devoted herself to patient advocacy, volunteering with the World Migraine Summit and Migraine Canada. After her own deep dive into brain retraining and the life-changing success she experienced, Kelly founded Brain Retraining for Chronic Pain to help others incorporate the brain retraining modality into their own migraine treatment plan. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Kelly. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. And I'm just going to bring up my screen and put it on slideshow. Great. Hopefully this works out and look, it's already started way ahead of things here. There we go. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kaylee, for the introduction. And thank you, Migraine Canada, for the opportunity to share my experience of the last couple of years with brain retraining. I am very passionate about this topic because retraining this brain has allowed me to enjoy a much fuller life in terms of both feeling good and the ability to participate in things that I had 
given up and perhaps I thought was never going to enjoy again. I know this is a really different topic, and I do hope I can present it in a way that is inviting. I'm sharing it through the lens of my experience with migraine and brain retraining, so it's a very unique experience for everyone. <clears throat> brain retraining is an addition to my other treatment strategy, so it's not an either or. And it is really important to note that pain research has exploded, much like migraine research, over the last 10 years. This is revolutionary for people with chronic pain, specifically neuroplastic pain, which we will be talking about. I hope this becomes common knowledge in the coming years. A simple overview of my experience is that I went from someone with chronic pain, of a chronic symptoms of pain, brain fog, fatigue, and frequent attacks. The month before I started brain retraining was one of those months many of us have experienced with 18 intense migraine days. Previous to starting main brain retraining, I was doing pretty good. I was having an up down. I was starting to incorporate a lot of lifestyle strategies, but I was still having some pretty rough months. Fast forward to today, two years and three months later, I have had one intense attack from the 1st of January to now. That is astonishing. I'm still, my, my whole family is still shocked to see the change that I've experienced. So I will first briefly touch on the science, and then I will share my strategies, some stories, as well as a couple of exercises to give you a feeling of what brain retraining is about. Okay. So what is brain retraining? So it is strategies that you use to help regulate the autonomic nervous system, that sympathetic and parasympathetic system that in many of us has become dysregulated. And so we regulate it to perceive symptoms and triggers and thoughts and feelings as safe. We use brain, mind, and body to learn new patterns to regulate our dysregulated autonomic nervous systems using the principles of neuroplasticity. So the autonomic nervous system regulates our involuntary physiological processes, heart rate, digestion, breathing, all of those things that are happening without conscious thought. If you, when you start doing your own research with brain retraining, which I hope many of you do, it can be called lots of names, limbic training, brain rewiring, neural retraining, and there's a specific program called pain reprocessing, ther pain reprocessing therapy, which is a very specific program that was started by Alan Gordon and the Boulder study team. Okay, so that is the start to brain retraining. So neuroplasticity, that is the ability that our brain can change and adapt through life in both positive and negative ways. And that's important because it was believed for a long time that once you got to this age, you were stuck with the brain that you have, but that is not the case. Our brains can change and that's powerful. So the brain learns from behaviors that are practice and creates neural pathways to shortcuts. So a lot of the behaviors that we now do without even thinking about, like sitting here talking, at one point you have to learn all of that, but your brain creates shortcuts for these complex tasks. It becomes easy and automatic. So the neurons, that fire together, wire together. We hear that saying, and that's what it means. Pathways that are created in our brain, and that's not really the scientific terminology, but when they, they, they work together, they start creating patterns in our brain that our brain follows. This repetition leads to automatic processes. So the automatic processes that, are, that we're talking about right now is the pain symptoms that we experience. But this means that neural pathways can change. That's important. So pain, what is pain? Well, it's gotten a pretty bad rap, but it is essential. 
Pain is a complex process involving many parts of the brain that protects us and allows us time to heal. Acute pain produces an alarm signal from an injury or, or, or disease. So if you were to put your hand near a hot object, you wouldn't have to actually touch that object for you to pull away because you have learned over your lifetime that that is hot and that alarm is going to happen. That pull it away will happen even before you you get too close to get burnt. That is a learned neural pathway. So for persistent and chronic pain, that continues after the injury has healed. It is a very simple description of what neuroplastic pain can become. So chronic pain is often neuroplastic pain. When pain persists, the nervous system becomes sensitized. We talked about central sensitization. You're probably hearing that in various places related to migraine. That means the alarm keeps going after that area has healed or a problem is solved. Nervous systems also then become very vigilant. They're hunting for danger signals and are really quick to send alarm symptoms. Now we have hypervigilant and a hypersensitive danger warning system. The brain develops a pattern of mistaking safe signals as dangerous, and that results in pain sensation. In my case, I knew no, at least part of what I was experiencing was neuroplastic pain. So, pain is from the brain. So, when I first heard this, I, I had a lot of difficulty buying it, which is interesting because I studied biology. I love anatomy and neuroscience. And there was part of me that knew that. And even part of my experience, I knew that. But I did struggle with it. So I got to say right off the bat, all pain, all symptoms are real. Pain is complex but it is always determined by the brain. The brain determines if we experience pain. The perceptions of pain, whether due to injury, disease, or neuroplastic pain are all real. That was a really big question that I got stuck on when I first started looking into brain retraining. And I think I got stuck for more than a year because of that question. I was, how could my attacks in the middle of the night when I wake up in so much pain and I'm vomiting and every part of my body is aching, how can that be due to my brain? But it is. It's due to a complex interaction of many systems that are designed to protect us. So it can be due to that. There are many examples of the brain deciding when to send pain signals. We often hear of heroic acts while the person is gravely injured, this is the brain deciding based on the situation, it is not going to send a pain signal. We hear of mothers or, or parents being able to get their children out of an unsafe situation with broken limbs. And that's because their brain is determined this is not a good time for pain and it will not send the pain signal. Inversely, the inverse can also happen. There's a really famous story um, of a construction worker jumping on a nail that goes right through his boot. And in great pain, he is rushed to the emergency. However, when that boot is removed, the nail has gone right between his toes. All aspects of the situation screamed danger. So the brain sent pain symptoms. His pain was real. So what is the main idea of brain retraining in relation to migraine? The underlying source of neuroplastic pain is danger and fear in our brain working to protect us. Any input perceived as negative, so internal, which is thoughts, feelings, emotions, even positive ones if they're really intense, which I experience with exercise, 
or, or sorry, or external like exercise or minor injuries can have an impact on our hypersensitive unconscious processing in our brain. So danger or fear is very individual. What one person experiences and what I do are very different. Scary movies are, they do it for me, but they don't bother other people at all. So chronic pain and symptoms may be neuroplastic. The great news is we can retrain our brains. We have a sensitive, or I do, I shouldn't speak for others, but people who brain retraining works for have a sensitive, excited, excitable, autonomic nervous system that is hypervigilant for danger signals. So last year, I had a very profound example of this, um, of how excited, overexcited and hypervigilant my nervous system is. I was out walking my dog and she took off across in front of me and her leash tripped me and I fell. I experienced a full sympathetic nervous system response. I was nauseous. I was fainting. My heart was pounding. I had to sit down or I would have fallen. And this was from this little fall. I mean, it was nothing. I scraped my knee, but my brain read danger and it went into full lockdown mode. So yeah, I'm pretty sure I have a very hyper excitable nervous system. So we're going to take a breathing break, which I really need. Um, breathing is something that we have as such an amazing, readily available, easy, easily accessible tool we can use anytime. So I use little breathing um, episodes, times all day long. It might just be two or three breaths just to calm my nervous system. So for this one, we're going to breathe gently in and on the exhale, allow the shoulders to drop and the body to completely relax. The ex extended exhale is a cue to the autonomic nervous system that you are safe and relaxed. So yeah, just be really gentle with the breathe in. So we're just going to do three. Thank you. I needed that. I do them, like I said, several times a day. I'll find opportunities or times when I just start to feel my symptoms ramp up that I'll just stop and do a, a couple easy breaths. So my experience with brain retraining, that was the little science portion. As mentioned, I volunteered with Migraine World Summit and Migraine Canada. And that exposed me to new strategies and really opened my mind. Central sensitization was a term that really resonated with me because it felt like my brain was sensitized. It felt like it was always looking for signals. When mind and body strategies like meditation, breath work, and yoga were recognized as helpful, that resonated with me when I made the time. When I learned lifestyle factors can have significant impact on my symptoms, so sleep, eat, exercise, um, staying hydrated, that was also really empowering. This was all new information at the time, and I was really interested in finding what I could do to help myself. Although tryptan and Botox did previously help, I still experience significant life debilitating impact from migraine. I'm one of those people that most medications have not helped or my side effects were too severe to continue with. So I learned about brain retraining on the Curable app. And although the app didn't really work for me, I was intrigued. And once I moved past the, uh, my brain did it thing that I got caught up in, which is understandable. I was really interested in finding out more. So I spent a year reading research, watching YouTube videos, reading the work of John Sarno, who was kind of the inspiration for the app and many others in the field. 
And after a year of pondering and, and research, I found uh, this little gem called The Way Out, a book I strongly recommend. In fact, I have gifted it to many people. Sorry. Um, I think I jumped one, did I? Yes. Oh, it went missing. Okay. Um, so The Way Out by Alan Gordon uh, with Alon Ziv seemed to relate more to my experience. Uh, the practical tips made sense. And um, yeah, it was just something I could really relate to. I'm sorry, something went missing here. Let me see. Hmm. I have a missing slide. Oh, well, it happens. Okay, so this uses the principles of somatic tracking. Okay, here we go. Um, and I found it really effective. So what is somatic tracking? Somatic tracking has been used for a very long time in meditation and mindful practices, but this one was designed more specifically for pain. It was a brain retraining hook for me. When I tried somatic tracking and I felt um, the impact of it, I was in. Uh, I knew the pain that I experienced with migraine moved around. Um, it would go from one eye to the other, to my sinuses, into my temples. But having it happen while I was gently observing it was new. I had observed my symptoms before. I don't know about you guys, but I would lay there with my migraine and I would observe my symptoms, but it was not gentle. It was in anger. It was in fury. Uh, the things I would say to myself regarding the pain were not things I would say here. It was not nice. I was very unkind to myself. So this was a really different approach. It's about just observing the sensations, but without judgment, describing it with gentle words. Before I would say stabbing in my eye, now I would talk about pointy pressing. I would talk about being hit in the head with a hammer, but now I would say pulsating pressure. Difference in the words I'm using. One's really aggressive and danger, one's gentle and descriptive. Looking at it from the perspective of my very hypervigilant brain now looking for danger sig signals, I am not so surprised that some of my attacks escalated with what I was saying to myself. Probably things I would never say to another person. So for somatic tracking, you observe symptoms without judgment or expectation of change. You describe the symptoms with gentle words like pressure, stretching, tight pointy shape. So as you hear, they're not words that sound aggressive or dangerous. You remind yourself that you are safe and the message from my brain is a mistake as there is no injury or disease there. It shouldn't be a long process and it shouldn't feel like work. It should be relaxed and easy. Somatic tracking is also meant to be used when there is some pain but not too much because when the pain is too intense, it is really difficult to be gentle and to focus on doing calming things. It's just too intense. So it's best to just work on calming the, getting through that, that migraine attack and then trying somatic tracking when the symptoms aren't so severe. So if you are comfortable with it, I would love to do a somatic tracking exercise. This is just a short one. If you are not wanting to do it, it's a good time for a little break. So if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes. You can do this with your eyes open, but it is somewhat easier with your eyes closed. Take a couple of slow, relaxing breaths, allowing your shoulders and jaw to relax. Bring your attention to the area of pain or sensation. Gently observe the sensation without expectation of change and without judgment. 
you are just an observer. Try to describe the sensations using gentle words. Where is it located? Is it tingly, pressing, pulling, stretching, pointy? Does it have a color, temperature? Is it in a small area or large? Does it spread? Is it steady or does it pulsate? Continue to gently observe and take a relaxing breath in and a long, slow exhale. Remind yourself that you are safe and that your brain's unconscious processes can get mixed up and misread messages that you are safe. Without expectation and without judgment, go back to the sensations and notice if the sensation has changed. It may be the same, it may be somewhat different, and both are okay. You are safe. Take a long, slow inhale and a relaxing exhale to conclude this somatic tracking exercise. So this is an example of a somatic tracking practice. When there were very few available online, I made one on YouTube for a friend, hi Peggy, and myself. Uh, but there's many excellent ones out there now. If you do want to check it out, it's on YouTube. It's called Nine Minutes Somatic Tracking and it's got a sunset picture. I don't use somatic tracking um, that long anymore. It was really helpful in the beginning, but now I can do little mini somatic trackings as I'm going through the day. Earlier today, I, I got a, a sharp pain here and I just paused for a couple seconds and take a look at it. Said, yeah, hi, see you there. Thank you for the warning. And it went away. So it doesn't seem to be, if I was having a, um, needing to do a bunch of them, I would, but I don't tend to need it so much. So it's an interesting thing that's happened over two years. So after I read that book, I did more research. I attended courses. Um, I read uh, this book, which is called Explain Pain. It's a much more scientific uh, view of things. Same end result, but coming at it from a different angle. It's by uh, Butler and Mosley, who also has a lot on YouTube. Um, Nicole Sachs has journal speak if you're someone who likes to write and it's also really interesting stuff. She's got YouTube website and courses. Um, Schubner's What is Pain animated videos are fantastic and he's also got websites and programs. So I pulled from all these different sources and I have found a few key things that are really important to me. Thoughts and words really matter. I started observing, let's see, my next one's there. I started observing my thoughts, my feelings, and my emotions around migraine and my symptoms. I had a very visible reminder of the impact stress can have. I've lost all of my hair. I have alopecia universalis, it is called. And in my case, it is due to stress. So I thought I was pretty tuned into that. I'd had the stress part under control over the last few years, I thought. I practiced my meditation and yoga pretty regularly. I used journaling um, when some big issues rolled around. I rarely got really upset about things. So I thought I was doing the stress part, but there was a huge part I was missing. You may have heard the term catastrophic thinking. So I heard it, but I couldn't relate to it. I didn't do catastrophic thinking. Maybe during attack. During an attack, it wasn't pretty. I, I can agree with that. Even during an attack now, um, I can say, I'm okay. My brain is sensitized. I need to let it calm down. 
there is no danger. So even during attack, now all of that language has changed. But perhaps I did catastrophic thinking before during attack. However, the minute to minute thoughts about migraine were a very different story. Once I really started paying attention, there were hundreds, often almost continuous, little niggly thoughts were going through my mind about migraine. I was living in a constant state of migraine fear. Just back here a little bit, and my brain that was always listening for danger was getting a lot of danger messages from me. So I've also learned it is really important to draw a connection between our thoughts and our physical symptoms because I think they've been kind of pulled apart that they don't go together. And again, we know they do. So have you ever experienced where you're away from home and you suddenly think, did I leave the stove on? I get this thing where I get a flush of color, my heart starts pounding, I feel like I'm going to be sick. This is, I've just had a thought and I get that kind of an intense reaction. Or another one that we can relate to is when there is a person that we're very attracted to and we get that same or different wonderful feeling that we can re relate to. We just have a thought and you get a very strong physical response. I think it's a really important thing to relate to with what I'm talking about. I also have another story with that one about the importance of um, how important it is to realize how powerful my thoughts are in terms of physical symptoms. So I was out again walking my dog. I do that a lot. And I was over, stopped over visiting a friend and there was a yellow jacket. It's a kind of wasp and it was buzzing me. I'd already been uh, stung at least twice that summer and they are nasty. They really hurt. So this yellow jacket is buzzing me and dang, the thing got me and I raced home. I could feel the stinger, got home, lifted my pant leg and there was nothing there. I had not been stung, but my brain was doing a really good job of protecting me. It thought I was in danger and it wanted me out of there is how I'm interpreting it. And uh, yeah, it worked. Thank you, brain. So now um, at that time, I was constantly assessing every aspect of my life. This is before I started brain retraining. I was looking for triggers preparing for and even predicting migraine symptoms and attacks. My thoughts were often really quiet, almost like whispers, background noise. Did I do it wrong last time? Did I eat too much? Did I eat too little? Hmm, is that a storm coming? Is that a low pressure system? I better check the barometer. What did I eat last night? Did I have peanut butter? All day long, I had these continuous little vigilance going on regarding migraine without even realizing it in an effort to prevent migraine symptoms. I was sending a barrage of danger and fear warnings, not loud. These weren't catastrophic thoughts. These little negative thoughts, anger, guilt, regret, frustration were all danger or fear signals sent to the vigilant protective part of my brain. When I realized this, it rocked my world. This was something I could change. I started paying attention and I redirected or challenged as many of these little thoughts as I could. Triggers. I no longer think of triggers. It is a tricky one as I understand uh, that the medical professionals want that info. And if I had to do it before seeing a neurologist, um, I would do it to a degree, but it doesn't help me at all to think about migraine all the time. So that was really interesting. So as an example, today when I was out walking my dog, first thing in the morning as the sun was rising, there was a red sky and my grandma's voice comes in my ear, red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. 
if that had been two years ago, my brain would have get, went straight to barometric pressure. There's weather coming. Oh my goodness. I would have gone straight. To, instead today, I was like, boy, we could use the rain. And it didn't actually. We were supposed to get rain today. Uh, so I've just completely changed the way I view my world. I think about, am I sending a danger signal? Am I sending fear singles, signals? Now, if I sleep too little, I'll just think I'll have a nap or I'll get to bed earlier. I don't tend to stress about it. Word choices. As my brain is always listening, I think of sensations or discomfort instead of pain, episodes instead of attacks, because I no longer believe my brain is attacking me. It's protecting me. Any words that put me at war or in battle with my body, brain, and mind, I don't see as helpful and they no longer make sense. I also don't use migraine most of the time in my thoughts as well, because it has been such a negative experience for me. I now just view myself as having a highly sensitive brain. With patience, time and consistency, I have changed that language and I've changed those conversations that were going on in the little recesses in my mind and the migraine symptoms decreased. I change now how I frame my choices. I look at my world in terms of healthy choices versus doing it or not doing it to prevent migraine attacks. Complete change in how I frame things. I recognize, recognizing warning signs is also really important. Our world is full of danger signals. So I had to make some choices to reduce the ones that I could. I've reduced how much I read the news. I've reduced time on social media. I've reduced screen time. I don't watch movies with suspense mu music. I can I can watch them with the music off, but there's something about that music that I cannot do. These are danger signals and we each have our own. They're gonna be unique for everybody and it takes a little bit of detective work to figure out what they are. I have a couple wearables like an Apple watch and it has health data. And apparently I cook and I vacuum like I'm training for an Olympic event. Uh, my phone will say, are you running? And nope, cutting veggies. So clearly I do have more work to do in this area. I need to pay attention to this heart rate that is going up and I don't need to, I need to do a bit more breathing and relaxing when I'm vacuuming and cutting veggies. Unless I guess I want it to be my workout time. Being more aware of it, I guess is my point. With migraine uh, symptoms, noise quieter, I can notice my signs and symptoms that my nervous system is excited. So now I pay attention. My signs are I get kind of a vibrating thing in my head, a bit of low grade head pain. My eyes might ache. I talk and I move fast. I get really hyper. That's when my family can notice. And then I get the inverse. I can yawn. I might get brain fog and fatigue, but they are all signs that my nervous system is dysregulating at that time. Now I accept it. I even say thanks for the warning. And if I can, I will stop or pause and take a break. If I can't, I slow down. I remind my brain that I am safe and that I will take a pause or a break soon. I try really hard to avoid pushing through as the warning signal will just keep getting bigger. If I reach that crucial point of no return, I will have an episode. This January, um, or the one, the one episode that I had um, in January, um, my brain gave me a lot of warnings. It gave me head pain, brain fog. We were traveling at the time and it had been a big day and we'd been lost and we hadn't eaten and we hadn't had anything to drink in a while. So, you know, my body's probably getting a little cranky with me. But the spark was when we sat down to sit with some people um, while we're waiting to get our hotel room, she shared a story about being carjacked and it was so vivid and my brain, I could, I could visualize it so well that it hit me with an instant attack, instant, I instant full on head pain. I had to go straight up to my room and I was down for two days and it was from 
that story, the danger signals that my brain picked up from that story was enough to give me a full-blown attack. Interesting, just so interesting. Now I pull back instead of pushing through. Before I was at war with migraine and determined to win. Guilt, shame, anger at symptoms. I would just take meds, push through. So the alarm got louder and inev inevitably I would have an episode and as mine were often three to four days, I'd be out for an extended period. I believe the time I spent with an attack was far greater than the time that I needed to calm my system had I known and understood what I understood now, understand now, and that my brain thought it was in danger. Everything um, is in hindsight. And I'm sorry, everything at that time was a must do. I must do this, I must do that. And in hindsight, I think a lot of them maybe were want to do's that I turned into must do's. I hope that makes sense. But I was putting a lot of unnecessary pressure on myself when I probably just needed to pull back. Regulating strategies. So these are again, very individual and I had to trial and error uh, to figure out my things. So you need to either calm or elevate your nervous system and that depends on need and, and individuals. For me, I'm a cold shower and cold plunge girl. Been into the, the lake this week. Warm baths might be better for some. Uh, frequent pauses, short breaks, or longer when needed without guilt. We have to stop guilting ourselves for doing what our bodies need us to do. A friend of mine, I was actually just uh, chatting with her today, a friend in Chicago, said that giving herself permission guilt-free to take a rest or a pause has made an unbelievable difference in her life. She just got back from, she went to Las Vegas. She just finished another trip. She's going on a big bike trip in Europe, all things that she was dreading, but she said, now I will just take a break. I won't apologize. I'll just tell my friends, hey, I need to take a little break. And she said, I never would have done that before. And it has been life-changing for her. Reading, walks, Vigorous exercise for some. For me, I need to hang upside down. I love that one. A uh, time with my critters, time with friends. I love finding creative solutions. <clears throat> I love putting notes up for myself, reminding me to do things. I had pictures of the brain and I would um, color it blue to change the color from red to blue. Be creative. Visualize. Oh, I did that because I don't visualize so well, but visualizing is great. Breath work, meditation, and yoga. Yep, they're great. Breathing strategies. You can use ones to calm and ones to energize. Wim Hof is great for energizing, but calming breaths throughout the day. It doesn't have to be an episode. It can just be, you know, two or three toilet breaks. I always do a little bit of extra deep breathing when I have a toilet break. Breathing is the only part of the autonomic nervous system we can consciously control. You're going to breathe without thinking about it, but you can think about it and control it. It is a powerful tool. Uh, I want to recommend Insight Timer. It is the only, it was rec recommended by a friend and it has a vast array of meditation practices and mini courses. I do, I'm just working on several mini courses right now. They're great. It is the only one that I've actually splurged and bought. I understand that I am retired and I have a lot of time for this. I know it'd be a lot harder to justify um, if I was working full time or raising or having kids or other responsibilities. I am very busy, but I was busier before. But I think I really do believe I would have had more time if I'd been trying some of these strategies. OK, we're getting pretty late here. So, yeah, so I'm going to move on. Um, reintroduce things. Gradually, I've been slowly reintroducing greater exposure. It's called means gradually bringing activities back in. Some believe you can just jump back into everything but that didn't work for me. I just brought it in very slowly. Diagnosis. If you buy that book, or you go online, you'll find there's certain things that seem to look for or 
seem to indicate that you have neuroplastic pain. Your chronic pain is neuroplastic pain, meaning it does not have um, disease or injury as the cause of it. It doesn't have a definitive diagnosis. It has clues, but the strategies can be helpful to anyone. It even helped me when I broke my wrist and there was injury. It really helped me deal with the pain. I have had migraine for 32 years. Pain had a very, very well-worn path for me. And I am enjoying incredible changes. So what I'm saying with that is it will take time. I have several friends that are experiencing amazing changes by trying brain retraining. And there are it is exploding. Experiencing and learning about brain retraining has completely changed how I perceive my brain and body and how I relate to my symptoms and my hypersensitive, easily excited, wonderful brain. This is just a little introduction to a very big topic. It is exploding now. If you have, if you Google brain retraining, you are going to see there is a multitude of practitioners, programs, sites. Um, I don't believe you need to spend a lot of money to see some success with this, but it does take commitment uh, to see some changes. And I think I just, I do have some slides here with some resources. Um, I think those are going to be posted. If there is enough interest, um, I do have a little website, which I don't tend to do much on, um, but I would be happy to put my teaching skills back to work and create a mini brain retraining starting course if people were interested in one. If you're interested, please send me an email. And likewise, if there are specific topics of interest that I can share, let me know and I will do the research and add it to my blog. So here are some of the programs. Uh, Gupta has a free 28, a 28 day free trial. Lynn House used to do, used to be for anybody in the world, but uh, they aren't anymore, but they do have excellent resources and a new podcast, Curable Health, which has the app and programs. Pain processing therapy is uh, reprocessing, that should be pain reprocessing therapy. There's some practitioners in Canada. Um, I found it really expensive. It's like $220 a session, but maybe if you're covered by private health care, I think some of the programs might be better. There are some out there that are really expensive. They're not worth it. There are so many reputable ones that are at affordable prices. And that is it. I hope, I hope uh, it has at least intrigued you to consider brain retraining. That's it. Are you there, Kaylee? I am. Thank you. Sorry, just um, had to find my mouse. Just unmuting everyone. Share. I hope you weren't um, scrambling to jot down uh, Kelly's recommended resources. We will include them in our post webinar email, so you'll have that all in your inbox. And before we move to our Q and A, we do have several questions submitted um, that I'll be posing to Kelly. Again, put any questions in the Q&A, um, but before we get to the Q&A, um, we hope that you found this webinar and this entire Mind-Body Connection series um, informative, um, valuable. Uh, we're really, as I said before, impressed with the, the number of people who registered and joined um, who are just open to learning about this new experience. Um, and should you be interested in donating to Migraine Canada, I am just, I was, and then I lost the chat. I was including a link in the chat, which I'll include again in a few moments, www.migrainecanada.org, or you can just visit our website as well. As a nonprofit charity, all money that is donated go directly back into our programs, such as these webinars. So we hope that you would consider donating. And with that, I am going to start with the questions, Kelly. Um, so the first one, uh, I thought we should start with this. <laughs> it's a comment, not a question um, from someone. I've been using Kelly's somatic tracking exercise daily for almost two months, and it has been very helpful. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. That's Isn't awesome. <laughs> that's really, really wonderful to hear. It's good feedback. 
All right, next real question. I have been attending physiotherapy for another issue. There we're taught or trained to exhale, engage, then inhale, relax. And that's the opposite of what you said. Is there a time for both? Seems there should be only one if we are retraining our brains. Well, that's a great question. And I mean, I'm, I have done a lot of breathing courses and I will do more. There are, there is a multitude of breathing techniques. So if that one is specifically designed for helping with healing with something, it might be, it may be very specific to that, but I'm just talking about like, when I finish here, I'm going to go upstairs and I will do some gentle inhales and some long exhales because long exhales tell your body you're in relax mode. Um, there's one called the psychological sigh, which is a you do it one normal inhale and you top it up with a little bit extra and then a long exhale. So there there's so many. Yeah, I can't speak specifically to it. Okay. Uh, I do recommend, though, this book by James Nestor. Brilliant, brilliant book. We'll make sure that that's included in the post-webinar. Yeah. And Take know. a Deep Breath is my favorite one on YouTube. He has a lot of really, really fun stuff and interesting things called Take, take a Deep Breath. Oh, I need to. <laughs> um, we had somebody um, let us know that they're currently reading The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. Oh, that's a Canadian author. Yes. Um, and then um, this person is thoroughly enjoying the book and asks if you have any recommendations um, for other books on the science behind brain oh. plasticity. So, yeah, it um, The Way Out is a really great one to start just because it has so many stories you can relate to. And it will... It has a checklist of neuroplastic pain that you can see to because neuroplastic pain can't be diagnosed, but it's things like do your do your symptoms move? Mine do. This eye, that eye here, my back. It's moving all over. Um, is it brought on by stress? So there's a list of things. Actually, I have it right here. Pain started out of nowhere. Uh, pain symptoms are inconsistent, delayed pain. And then there's some possible personality traits. I don't know what I think about that part. But anyway, I just went ahead and gave it a go and it worked for me. And I explain pain is, is the book that is much more scientific. And the research, the research is unbelievable what is happening right now. There is an extensive amount of research, like just in this one, if this book is really expensive. But even in the way out, there's an extensive amount of um, research articles. And then you just start putting in the words and it will bring up all of the new research that's going on. You can spend a lot of time just going through the research. It's incredible. Okay, thank you. Um, another comment. My favorite part in the somatic exercise is when Kelly says, you are safe. <laughs> Yeah, I say that to myself all day long. Just when I can feel those little bubbling up, it's starting, you're safe. It's just your brain. Brain, we're good. Thank you. Got the message. Like I talk to my brain all day long. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kelly, what about, we talked about brain retraining for pain. So what about other non-pain migraine symptoms such as oh, yeah. vestibular symptoms, fatigue, swelling eyelids? Yeah, I use it for everything. I I I don't discriminate. Pain is is it's pain is the one that seems to knock us out. Um but once I dug through the pain, then I had all these other symptoms and um yeah, absolutely. Pain is kind of easier to zero in on, but um uh, we can see my cheeks are going red right now. I get this this like nerve sensation. So when I'm done here, I'll go up and I'll lay down for 10, 15 minutes and just, you know, do some somatic tracking on that area to calm things down. I do it on my neck. Um, and that's more like a, a bit of a nerve pain. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you can go wrong by trying it on anything. Oh, what? 
What do you think about during the the tracking with closed eyes and breathing? Um, what's your advice about softly touching or rubbing the spot that you're focused on? Oh, that's really interesting because um, I don't know about rubbing, but I, I do something like this sometimes because what I can do, and I don't necessarily do it when I'm actually in the middle of somatic tracking, but my sessions are very short. But if I lose touch of what the sensation is, so I've got a little bit of something starting here, I will push somewhere else and say, that's what pressure feels like. And it will remind me that that's exactly what this feels like. This is pressure. And so this one, because it's been there so long, starts, I my brain says it's pain, but it's pressure because I can relate it to something else. But I do also sometimes just do softly uh, touching an area to help bring my, my brain to it and to change the sensation. But I kind of do it at a different time. Okay, thank you. Um, someone else has asked, is the intention of these regulating practices to prevent a full migraine reaction once you've recognized the warning signs, or is it to reduce the intensity of the overall symptoms? All of the above. My symptoms, so even if I do have a migraine episode and I don't get them so often now, if one manages to break through, I, I will... Um, continue to use it until it gets bad but my symptoms now are less intensity and less frequent I'm always trying to find them now in the very early stages and that's what happened is once I realized all this background talk was going on as I said the noise the noise went away and I could start feeling things that were hidden in this more intense pain. It was kind of like pulling back the layers. I feel like I've gone back 30 years and this is probably what I started with. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer that question? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, I don't know if you would know this. What percentage of migraine patients does this apply to? Um, what if a symptom's person's symptoms are generated by an actual physical cause within the brain and nervous system? Um, so what, what the logic is behind this and the science is behind it is if you've had an injury and that injury has healed, there's been time for the injury to heal, there's a really good chance that neuroplastic pain is pay, playing a part in it. So there's some things um, with certain like um, uh, rheumatic uh, rheumatoid arthritis and things that it doesn't relate to, but many things if the injury is healed. So mine may have been from bungee jumping in, in a car accident. It was also a really stressful year. My mom died. I moved to another country. I had all of this stuff happening and I think my brain just went, what? Um, but the neck pain has stayed. And I am still working on it because I believe it is sensitized and I, but I didn't, I didn't, I believe there was something wrong with my neck because I do have a diagnosis of arthritis in my neck, but 60, 70% of my age group have arthritis in their neck and many feel no pain. So I'm not buying it anymore. I think it's, it's neuroplastic. So it's, it's worth getting the book and taking a read, but I think I, like I said, I even used it on my broken wrist. Here's a great one. My daughter closed her fingers in the garage door. and We've been talking about this neuroplastic pain, but I've been talking about strategies to deal with pain. She closed her fingers in the garage door and she had to hurry and get somewhere. And she went, I don't have time for this. She said the pain just went away. So it came back later. So do I think you can use it anywhere? I really do. I think you can use it a lot of times, but the big idea is to calm our nervous system and help our brains to desensitize and to be less vigilant. So stop feeding the, the vigilance, stop feeding the sensitivity, calm yourself down and allow all of it to start feeling safer. 
think that's yeah thank you kelly mm -hmm. um somebody else has asked can we start some kind of support group for people with migraine who are working on brain retraining i'd love to do that through we could do it through my website or i mean I could set up a Facebook page or if somebody wants to set something up, I'll moderate it. I don't see, I did, I set up this great little website. Thankfully my daughter helped me, but I haven't been really great at adding it because I don't know what people want. And I kind of feel like I'm out there in the dark and I'm mm -hmm. doing all of this. I'm, I'm not doing it at any cost, but I would love to see that. I think people chatting to each other about this and supporting each other is a fantastic idea. I'm on side and I will help in any way I can. In our post webinar um, email that will have the recording and the list of all the resources that Kelly has referred to tonight. And we're also gonna include a link um, for a, a survey for any feedback. Um, and maybe we can include a question in the survey if you'd be interested and then they can provide their contact information. All right, next question. Kelly, do you know of any resources available in French? Great question. I don't. I don't. I don't speak French. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised. There's great research going on. France is really on top of a lot of this stuff. Um, sorry, I don't know that. And I do have an email address. Uh, will you be sharing the email address as well, Kelly? If you'd like it included in the post webinar email. Would yeah, you, you can, that? as well as my website. My website has my email on it. And okay. so if people, you know, we want to work together to figure out how to do something with that support group. I'm, I'm on board. Okay. Um, what do you recommend is the most affordable and effective way to learn brain retraining. You've already mentioned some apps and products can be expensive. Start here. Start here. I really, a guy had spent a year. I'm reading everything I could get my hands on. And this kind of brought me to, okay, I'm ready to give this a go. And I feel like this is so much faster. What's interesting is I listened to him on a podcast and uh, at that particular time, his symptoms had come back. So he was, he's gotten into this because he's had, he's had them all. He has got this list of every symptom he has had. It's been his legs, his knees, his neck, his, um, and he was back in trouble and he was trying to work on his own brain. I think what happened is he got so popular because of this book that he became overwhelmed and then those danger and fear mechanisms kicked in. Um, but that is where, if it was me, I would start. Curable, I think for some people is great. It just didn't resonate for, for, with me. Right. Thank what you. other resources? Um, I would say YouTube. There's some really great, interesting uh, webinars. Uh, Lorimer Mosley has some really interesting ones and you're going to get one for, there's a little video series. It's six videos called What is Pain? And it's a really, really good Kickstarter as well. Oh, there we go. Somebody said Alan Gordon has a podcast called Tell Me About Your Pain. There you go. Um, the late, The young lady who's got the Curable app also has a podcast. So there's, there's, all kinds of resources out there. The thing is, you just have to start putting the time in and make it consistent. That's the trick. It's got to be consistent. So you can't, you, I mean, when those little thoughts sneak in that are really negative, you got to challenge them. You've got to say, nope, nope, that's, nope, my brain is just protecting me. When you feel the symptoms, you got to back it off for a minute and breathe for a second or do I mean, for me, I'd pop in and have a cold shower. You got to find your calming strategies and then you've got to use them. Um, what do you think about the next question, Kelly? Um, how do we apply brain retraining strategies as a preventive measure without developing an obsession or creating just another type of hypervigilance? Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, so... I, I talked about, so like if I go out for dinner, I'll eat what I want to eat now. And the, so what you're saying is looking for these little thoughts. 
um, you'll start feeling them. You will start because as I said, they were kind of background noise for me. But once I started looking, I would see them. And so a pop would pop up and I'd go, my brain would say storm clouds. And I'd go, yep, storm clouds, cool. Millions of people are around, they have storm clouds and we're all good. And so it, it wasn't like an argument or it wasn't telling, it was just really gentle. And um, just if they came up and they just, you start, you start hearing them. They will just come to you because you're now paying attention. And that is the difference. Before I was pushing them away. Oh, shut up. I can't, haven't got time for this. Whereas now I'm like, I want to hear it. I'm listening. Okay. I got the message. I'm going to calm down. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fine. So I had a bit of peanut butter. I'm fine. So, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So it, it's getting pretty late. I'm going to um, there's somebody who says they have the curable app and really enjoy it and I used it um, two and a half years ago so I'm thinking it has probably changed a lot since then so yeah there you go and uh, there's a like like mind like body podcast fantastic I love these things okay um from another uh attendee I often have moments of depersonalization when my migraine symptoms become very prominent Despite believing I'm quite attuned to my symptoms and body sensations and feel I'm quite able at reassuring my brain that it's safe and we are not in danger, the symptoms are temporary. However, it still happens a lot. How long did it take you to notice a significant decrease in the number of migraine symptoms? And would having professional assistance be useful in my case of chronic daily migraine? I would say if there has been... Um adverse events, especially in childhood that maybe haven't been deal dealt with, that is a, seems to be a really common one that you hear at Migraine World Summit coming up often, or if there's, there's things that, yeah, find a professional if you think that's possible. It, I started, when I started seeing, when I did some somatic tracking, I then was like, okay, I think I'm onto something for me. And it was a couple months later before I started noticing the thought stuff. So then I started working on it. And as I said, it's been two years and three months, but it was gradual. And then I would have a month where I wasn't getting attacks, but I was getting the chronic symptoms a lot. So just a, a low grade headache that was quite annoying or my jaw would ache or these things. So it was a roller coaster ride mm. um, that has taken time. And everyone's experience is going to be different. But I would never say no to getting professional help or doing one of the programs. The Gupta program is, is 350. Oh, it's 28 days for free right now. That might be worth trying. It's a good program. It's very consistent. I like things that change up a bit. It's a consistent one, but it's uh, I believe it's free right now for 28 days. That's pretty good. Well, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm just going to put share my screen. Um, your presentation, there's so much information in your presentation. We've had a lot of uh, positive feedback in the chat, and people really enjoyed hearing your personal story and understand it. This was your journey, and it's it's inspiring that you found relief through this path. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you everyone else for registering for tonight's session. Uh, just a reminder that um, you can go to our events page. All of our Q2 webinars have been posted. We have four webinars in the next three months. Um, again, please consider donating to Migraine Canada to support our programs if you find this information valuable. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Migraine Canada. Join our community. I'm sure most of the people attending tonight are already members and they receive our e-blasts. And for any healthcare professionals, email us at info at migrainecanada.org to request a participation certificate. And that's it for tonight, everybody. Uh, we went a little bit over, but uh, we can see most of you were able to keep with us for the entire presentation tonight. Thank and you I very much, everybody, for showing up. It's great to hear that uh, this, is, this is spreading. Excellent. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Kaylee.